Hey everyone, Brian here. Our adventure today is about power and politics. When I was growing up, I was lucky enough to live in a neighborhood with an abundance of kids my age, free time, and most importantly, a big field close by. That grassy field became everything from a World War II battlefield to a rugby pitch, and while we did a lot of things there, the one game we played most was American football. Okay, not that long ago. Come on. There we go. The games would always start off well, but sometime around the first, was it a touchback or a safety dispute, we'd start to argue over rules. It wasn't that none of us knew the rules, it's just that we were acting in our self-interests and were willing to interpret them creatively to win. Outside of the game, I had a friend that even said, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. <laughs> well, needless to say, the vast majority of our football games ended in an argument. Occasionally, my dad, who played football in college, would become the arbitrator. Sometimes he could help us through those arguments. There was a much better chance that we'd actually finish a game if we had someone who wasn't playing to help us apply the rules fairly. In essence, we needed someone to help us govern our little games, and funny enough, communities and countries need that too. Our objectives today are to describe theories about the origins of governmental power and to describe unitary, federal, and confederal governmental structures. Today we'll explore four widely acknowledged origin theories for governmental power, but there are more out there. The first among them is called the force theory. Anyone who has ever had to deal with a playground bully is familiar with this concept. Someone big enough and strong enough to boss everyone around is the big cheese. He sets the tone. The might makes right attitude is probably the first model for assuming governmental authority in human history. In early nomadic tribes, the one who could run faster, hit harder, and stand taller was generally considered the leader. This might doesn't have to be raw strength, though. Great skill or inspiring leadership could also allow special individuals to rise to the top. Michael Jordan wasn't the strongest player in the NBA physically, but he was certainly a great leader and very talented. This idea of government is seen throughout history when powerful military leaders took charge of their armies. Can you think of any historical examples of military leaders coming to control the government? Julius Caesar, Genghis Khan, and Napoleon Bonaparte are all great examples. Another theory is Plato's evolution theory, which details five stages of government that all societies will experience. Plato believed that a society will begin with a kingship or autocracy, one big cheese to rule them all. This guy will eventually screw up badly enough so that some other important people decide they need to step in. Society then enters a democracy. A group of landowners will decide that they want to make sure that their lands are protected from unwise or upsetting decisions. They form a council which advises the big cheese. Next is an oligarchy. In this, we've lost the king and we retain the ruling council of landowners. A small, powerful group makes all the decisions for the society. The fourth stage is a democracy. A landowning council may still be involved, but most decisions are made by elected representatives of the people. And finally, we have tyranny. Plato believed that inevitably democracy will meet a crisis that it cannot deal with and the people will choose or be forced to have a single leader to take control. This starts the whole process over again. The third theory is called the divine right of kings. Percy Shelley wrote a poem about an ancient leader named Ozymandias. The poem includes this line. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look upon my works, ye mortals, and despair. <laughs> the idea of a man standing above all others, believing he is more than a mere man, is the whole point of the divine right theory. Ozymandias was the Greek name for Ramesses II of Egypt. 
He believed that he was the son of gods and that power for ruling flowed through him alone. This one might be a little tougher, but let's try again. Can you name any historical empires ruled by someone who was considered a deity or was chosen by one? If you need to search online, we'll let it slide this time. <laughs> Take a minute to find an example to describe in your PDF. Rulers of Persia, France, Germany, Rome, and, of course, Egypt all subscribed to the divine right theory. And lastly, the social contract. This modern theory is the idea that the people enter into a contract or agreement with each other and an authority. Everyone gives up some power to the authority so it can administer justice and keep order, but leaders are accountable to the people via elections. Enlightenment thinkers Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau put forward these ideas, which many historians point to as the intellectual origins of the U.S. Constitution. Which theory makes the most sense to you? Is it possible that more than one of these theories is correct? Pause the video here to respond in your PDF. Make sure to explain your thinking. All of them are intriguing to me, and they're worth investigating more if politics is your thing. Regardless of who is in power, there are three ways for government to be structured. A government can be a unitary organization, a federation, or a confederation. In a unitary system, all authority lies in the hands of a central government. While smaller areas are allowed some local administration, such as mayors, police and fire departments, and the like, the majority of decisions are made by a national government. The United Kingdom is a good example of this model. At almost all levels, the Parliament, or Representative Congress, makes decisions for everyone. The advantage of a unitary system is that it is fast-acting, because all the power is in one place and there are fewer checks and balances holding things up. The disadvantage of a unitary system is that when mistakes are made, they tend to extend nationwide because decisions are made for everyone. A federal government is a government with multiple levels, including a central government and member states. Each level has its own powers, laid out according to a constitution which cannot be infringed upon by the other levels without due process. What makes this system a federation is that the central government has supreme authority. When federal leaders make decisions, the member states are obligated to follow them. Can you name a country with a federal system? If you said the U.S., you're right. But there are many others, including Mexico, Canada, India, and the Federated States of Micronesia. The benefit of a federal system is that all the member states are represented in the central government. But the disadvantage is that it can be hard to find a balance between large and smaller member states. Public opinion in some states can create a tyranny of the majority, in which laws that aren't necessarily popular with the nationwide electorate are passed at a national level. Federations are also notorious for acting slowly. The last structure is called a confederation. In a confederated system, each member state within the confederation agreement participates voluntarily. The central government can only act with the support of member states. The first government plan for the U.S. was a confederation where the states had more authority than the national government, and it was very difficult for much to get done at the national level. This demonstrates one of the disadvantages of a confederation. Member states do not have to follow along. The ability of a confederacy to inspire loyalty in a time of crisis is often pretty low as people are typically more loyal to their regional interests than people all around their country. An advantage is that individual citizens have more political power at the state and local levels. So giving the power to these levels gives people more authority over the affairs in their own community. As we continue our study of geography, it's important to keep an eye on who has power, how they got that power, and what they do with it. In what ways do you interface with your local, state, and federal governments? 
Which elected representatives make decisions that affect you? Do their decisions align with your worldview? What about the worldview of other people in your community? These are just a few questions you can ask to help make the world around you come alive. Remember to ask questions, be curious, and until next time, keep exploring. Hey, hey.